Hello and welcome to everyone both here in the room and those joining us virtually online today. My name is Sharon Edwards and I'm the medical education manager for the ASC solutions team um, of Zimmer Biomed and we're so glad that you're here to join us today. We as Zimmer Biomet know that elective surgeries are changing this year, especially with everything that's happening and more and more of those surgeries moving out of the hospitals and into the ASC environments. And many surgeons who have been usually solely um, hospital surgeons are now looking at the possibility of moving into an ASC as well. But they don't know whether this is the right time for that move or frankly, how to even get started. Today, we're gonna talk with you um, about some opportunities that Zimmer Biomet has to offer to become your trusted partner within this ASC space. Within our ecosystem of solutions, we focus on four main areas, management services, care optimization, interoperative solutions, and post-operative solutions. We have today with us two very prominent and high volume surgeons who do upwards of 75% of their total knees and hips in their ASCs. So please welcome Dr. James Ballard from the Oregon Surgical Institute out in Portland, Oregon, and Dr. Trevor Pickering from the Mississippi Sports and Ortho Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, Sharon. Good to be here. These surgeons are owners in their own ASC and have used Zimmer Biomet Solutions to help make their ASCs very successful with their patient care. And today we'd like to walk you through a total episode of care uh, with an ASC and provide you with examples of how Zimmer Biomet can come and be your trusted partner um, as you begin your ASC journey. So let's start with management services. One of the divisions that Zimmer Biomet has um, for our solutions is called Accelero Consulting Services. And this group can actually help you in one of two ways. They can either come into your current ASC and help uh, your care team develop protocols and efficiencies to help you make you better, or they can um, also come and help you start a brand new ASC. So if you're, you just don't have any idea where to get started, they can come and help you with that practice, much like they did with Dr. Ballard's group out in Portland, Oregon. So Dr. Ballard, if you don't mind, would you kind of walk us through how Accelero helped develop uh, protocols and efficiencies within your ASC and got you up and running? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. This, this is an exciting topic. I'm really happy to be here with Trevor um, and kind of walk through how this has worked for each of us. When we started doing outpatient totals in or up in Portland, it's probably about eight years ago. And that was actually before Accelero uh, even existed. And we we started in a very small ASC, kind of a sports, typical sports ASC with a very small footprint. We used an outside consulting service to kind of bring together a program and we kind of got our feet wet. We knew we would eventually build something bigger after we kind of proved the concept. You know, seven or eight years ago, this wasn't very common. So we had to make sure it was going to work. Once we knew it would work and saw the light about six years ago, I had not gotten I had gotten to know the people in the Accelero uh, arm of, of Zimmer all from its inception, knew what they were developing. It was quite different um, in a good way than the consulting arm or company we had used for our first place. Uh, they offered such a holistic package. Um, they were so dedicated and had such great ideas that when we started and, and built our de novo location, which we really built for high acuity cases like spine and total joints, I, I knew we'd bring them in because there's, it, it, as we're going to talk about in the next hour, it, it's a big deal to do this. And it's intimidating. I don't care how smart you are or how accomplished you are. It, it's intimidating to think about doing this and making this transition. And so we brought Accelero to the table. It was interesting because RASC is a group of rivals. It's the high volume surgeons in Portland that don't belong to the same group. We don't use the same company. We don't use the same implants. And we made an, an agnostic choice when we chose Accelero. We brought everybody to the table and Accelero was our hand, hands down choice. And looking back on it, um, I don't see how it would have happened without them. Yeah. And I'll just, let me just highlight something Jim said, you know, this is you know, when we started, it was, we were looking at a blank canvas. Uh, again, we started a good seven plus years ago as well. There were really, there wasn't a whole lot for us to base it on. And we were sort, we started in a smaller ASC and, you know, we realized that we could do a total knee or total hip replacement and send them home. And that was great. But we also realized immediately 
that we needed a pathway from beginning to end that would make this a long-term uh, process, something that could be adaptable and that could be expanded uh, and that we could look at 10 years down the road. And so it, this is something where like Accelero comes in and we can look at every step of the way uh, so that we are ready to move as insurers move and as more and more patients come on board and make this sustainable. So I think that this has, you know, implications uh, for short and long term for any docs today who want to get started on this. And one of the best things you said, Trevor, that I think we will highlight, and I just love how you say this, you know, it's longevity and sustainability and future looking. Yeah. Um, you can drop a total hip into an ASC and get lucky, but you can't do 1500 a year and do it for 10, 12, 13, 14 years. To do that, to approach that longevity, you need a foundation. And I don't care, again, how smart you are. Laying this kind of foundation, that's what Accelero is for. Right. And that's where they can come in. And with all we're going to talk about, lay out this plan, develop this ecosystem, and let you do exactly what Trevor is doing in Mississippi and what we're doing here. Great. Yeah. Well, let's move on then to care optimization. And Dr. Ballard, I was known that Excel Accelero is also very instrumental in helping you and your group set protocols and standardizations um, in your pre-op routine. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, we're kind of a band of rivals and I'm, I'm totally not joking when I say that. I mean, we're the surgeons in, in our location are the guys that if I didn't do the total knee, they were gonna do the, the total knee. So in a traditional failed paradigm, the way we typically look at things, you know, where we fight each other, uh, we decided to come together. <clears throat> so in doing that, we were a lot like this slide. I mean, different fellowships, different implant systems, different hospitals, different backgrounds. And of course, like everybody listening to this talk, who's a doctor, we all thought we had a better idea than the guy across the street from us. But we knew, and, and Trevor alluded to this, there is an absolute necessity in this situation, transitioning totals to the outpatient environment for complete standardization. We all know about evidence-based medicine. We all talk about best practices. AUKUS as a meeting, in my opinion, the, the power is in coming and finding out what those things are and go, going home and implementing them. So we had the idea that we would take all these different, 10 different groups of surgeons, et cetera, and come around a common path where it was really soup to nuts, you know, beginning to end. <clears throat> and that, that is no small thing to do. So Accelero was key in helping that because number one, as Trevor said, they brought templates to the table. They gave us a skeleton framework to work with. We didn't have to just start making it up. Like, okay, I didn't get a piece of paper and write down pre-op order set and start filling it in. They came and said, here's an example of this. Here's an example of that. Here's an inclusion exclusion criteria. And then we fought it out. I mean, we argued and we went back and forth, but Accelero was there to keep the conversation, you know, in between the goalposts or whatever, and to keep us cohesively talking and to move us through it. There is no chance that we could have accomplished what we did without somebody in the room keeping us on task. So when you come to our place now, there are 10 surgeons that do total knees. And there is one pathway from the very beginning to the very end, one order set. I mean, you know, one way of draping everything from beginning to end. And that this thing is something that we jokingly call the kumbaya circle, you know, taking the confusion and coalescing around a pathway. I'm really proud of what we did. And, you know, we did it because we were committed to it. But man, without a third party like Accelero there with the, the power they brought to that discussion, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I think I just like to emphasize the importance of standardization. Uh, yes, it's very important for the surgery center and its uh, continued success. It's important for the surgeons. It's very important for the staff uh, who understands that every knee gets the same protocol and you don't have to memorize, you know, four different ways of prepping, draping or packing instruments or what kind of anesthesia protocol they want to use. But the people who really notice this and benefit are the patients because they are kept on the same page, whether I'm doing their surgery, my partner's doing their surgery, they are educated the same way before surgery. They have this, they arrive the day of surgery with the same expectations. 
Uh, we have the same protocols post-operatively so that they're not getting a mixed message from one nurse before surgery, a PACU nurse after surgery, a uh, physical therapist, you know, a week down the road. It's all the same message. And I cannot tell you how far that goes, especially in an outpatient setting where we are responsible for that message that to keep them, uh, to keep the messaging the same, it, it is a reason that patients are safer in this setting adopting this and that their satisfaction scores are higher. Uh, and it's one of the things that we get complimented on the most is the consistency of the messaging to patients that comes from the standardization. And it's funny, Trevor, because I don't think in the hospital we paid any attention to that. Zero. We didn't pay attention to what the care, what the support person, the spouse right. felt like, what the patient felt like. But man, I've learned, like you said, that they cue off of everything. Yeah. And so the second they smell something off or different, their confidence drops. But to the flip, like you said, that caregiver who's walking in going, man, you know, they know from the beginning how solid it is. And you said they see that everybody goes, oh yeah, we can totally do this. This is going to be great. But they get it because of the messaging that you just talked about. That's right. Yeah. And we know one of the biggest concerns that we have with is with our patients, right? Because we're moving them to um, a place where they they felt comfortable with, but we're moving into a different environment. And now we're telling them that we're going to go home within 23 hours. And, and, and frankly, most of them are going to be going home within a couple of hours after this major surgery. So how do you help them get ready for that? How do you help them prepare mentally for um, going home just a couple hours after surgery? Yeah, Sharon, I wanna say something to, to just pre precede this. Sure. It's really important for people to understand that, you know, I think when Trevor and I started this, the, it, the, the dialogue was, oh man, this better be as good, or, you know, gosh, am, am I kind of forcing a square peg into a round hole? Because we were paradigm shifting. And in Trevor, I think you'll agree with me. There is, and we've got, we're publishing data on this. The experience is better. It's not equivalent. It's not a lateral move. It's a vertical move. Right. Lower complication profiles across every spectrum. Higher patient satisfaction scores. Yeah. I mean, everything you can think of, it is a vertical move. So, and it's important, I think, for people to realize that we're not proposing something that's equivalent. Do you agree to that, Trev? Yeah, I agree completely. You know, and when we envisioned our current ASE, uh, we envisioned it for outpatient total joint specifically, and we wanted it to be a better experience in the hospital, a concierge type experience. We wanted to be able to expose them to the best possible services and outcome. And so, you know, that meant that our role changed a little bit when we transitioned to the outpatient setting. You know, prior, I would have a patient in the hospital, I'd do the surgery uh, around the next day and you know, that was it. Uh, but now I've got to think about how am I going to educate them before surgery? Uh, how am I going to establish their expectation the day of surgery? How am I going to manage their post-operative care? And, you know, we started out just sort of replicating what we had been doing in the inpatient setting where we had sort of a boot camp. Uh, and we found that that was getting difficult, especially for my patients who were driving three hours. You know, you're not going to ask them to make a separate trip for a boot camp day. Uh, we prepared the mega binder of information that we gave to patients. Uh, we then moved to a, a having a nurse navigator uh, so that in the when we were starting this up actually until pretty recently, well, we're still using nurse navigators. We've got a tremendous one right now, actually. But, uh, you know, we now have a volume such that a nurse navigator cannot go and make home visits or contact each and every patient or double check everything beforehand, although we still do that uh, attempt that. But we decided we needed to have something different and new. We wanted to utilize newer technologies to see if we could make this experience with the patients, this beginning, middle, and end continuity experience better for the patient where we can actually have more contact with them and engage the patient more, even though we were sending them home an hour after surgery. So we started to work more with my mobility. Uh, and this is something we found to be particularly useful because it allows us not only to communicate with patients directly, uh, but I can be messaging these patients daily, several times a day, before surgery and after surgery. And these patients feel they're more connected to me. Uh, there's not a two week gap from the day I do surgery to when I see them back in clinic. They're communicating with me, even if it's virtually every day. 
And so I get patients like uh, Steve here, who's based on one of my patients when I was kind of looking into the patient experience with my mobility. Uh, this is a patient who chose to uh, utilize it with the Apple Watch. You can also use it with the phone. There's no cost to it if you utilize the watch. Um, but he is getting messages from me daily that I decide. I decide which messages he's getting, which education modules, which exercises he's getting, which reminders he's getting. So that he knows that I, I am there w essentially watching him, even though he's at home. And so what it means is he gets to be in the comfort of his own home with his caregiver, who's also getting these messages, who's being trained uh, as well. Uh, and yet he's getting a, a lot of instruction from us as we're going along that I've determined, I've determined, you know, the uh, messaging that he gets. Uh, and we can address things like his anxiety, when his block wears off and he gets to know, you know, because I know when that block's gonna wear off, he doesn't. And I can message him at seven o'clock that morning uh, when he starts his PT saying, you know, this, I know it's hurting, but you gotta know that's normal. And guess what? These patients love it. They feel engaged. They feel much less anxiety. Uh, they're coming back to my clinic happier with better motion and they're using less pain medication. That's data that we're collecting that will come out. But clinically, these patients are very, very pleased. And I don't, I, I'd like to know what Jim's experience has been if he's had some of that same, uh, some of that same experience. And, and also, and this is a great slide because we're collecting who's and who's scores and any other kind of score we want by simply asking these patients questions. And they're, they're simply answering my questions and I'm utilizing that for these scores, which we are then using uh, when we're talking to insurers and eventually when we're talking to Medicare and we're gonna have to actually prove uh, that we are having uh, adequate outcomes within a certain parameter. We just, we get it automatically with mobility. So it's helping, again, this is going to the sustainability of the model, uh, which this is contributing to as well. Yeah, that, that was a really great explanation of that. And we're, this is a topic that we could talk about for two hours, right? The, the importance of this level of engagement. It's important, Trev, that people understand that when you say, you message them that you're probably off in the operating room Correct. and that message is happening. So with my mobility, you're able to algorithm, if that's an appropriate verb, out interactions for as much as you want for the 90 day period. And you determine with the help of the my mobility team, what message they get on what day. So Trevor says appropriately, I know when the block is going to come off. So the day it's going to come off, you send them a message. Hey, guess what? I bet you're hurting more today. Because right. people get anxiety when something happens they don't anticipate. Right. So to, to backtrack a little bit, um, it's impossible to overemphasize the need for preparing patients and pre-educating them and giving the, and the person that's going to help them. Yeah. Trevor talked about it for minutes, right? That's how important it is. You just can't drop these people in the ASC and tell them good luck. And I think in everybody's hospital programs, we've established so much the importance of that that it's kind of the norm now. But when your volumes build, and even when the volumes haven't built and you're still in a low volume status, we we started online tools. There was a predecessor to my mobility. Now I'm using my mobility. Um, bringing this online engagement tool in does so many things. I can't even conceive. There's We couldn't do this without an online tool. I don't see how we could do it. Because- yeah, and I'll tell you something, you know, one thing I've noticed too is that, you know, and I mentioned it earlier, we, we used to do the big binder, a patient education binder, you know, as part of like a boot camp thing. And I'll tell you, uh, I spent a lot of time on that uh, over the years, you know, writing that, perfecting it. It was based on, you know, the one that we used in fellowship, which was excellent. And I know my fellow mentor is watching this, so I had to throw that in there. But, um, uh, you know, one thing I've noticed is that you can have the biggest binder in the world or the snappiest binder in the world, and it is nothing compared to getting a message the day your block's going to wear off, that that's normal to have pain after your block wears off, yeah. okay? And it, there you know, is no comparison about how superior it is to have the daily messaging come in little two-sentence snippets compared to the big binder. I think it's important to point out that what you're talking about, Trevor, is just-in-time education delivery. So right. you give that binder you spent all that time on, I bet it was awesome looking. People <laughs> might look at it. Frankly, a lot of people don't look at it. It goes on the shelf. They can't find it. When they're hurting, 
on yeah. day three. They're not flipping through the binder no. looking for the pain tablet. But guess what they have with them? They have their phone. They have their Apple yes. Watch. Yeah. So, so their- you've you programmed it to hit them with information. Exactly. It, when that information hits them, your staff isn't doing it. The, the right. program is doing it automatically. And then you know that on day seven, something should happen or day 10 or whatever. Right. And so all this education is delivered just in time. So there is no flipping through something, finding the binder, forgetting about that they read it. Um, right. And the other thing is that it's so important when we do these outpatient totals, because everybody's so worried about, oh my gosh, well, what happens? Like who follows them? And, you know, well, it's better. It's better yeah. than rounding. It's better. The care episode is improved, which is a bit counterintuitive because it's such a paradigm flip. But- much more complete, much more complete now. And they're getting it in digestible snippets and they're remembering it rather than everything being thrown at them in a class three weeks before surgery. And they feel more connected to me yeah. than they ever did before. Because we haven't even talked about my, my mobility folks don't call me. They message me. Right. And then the message is, is found by my care team, Correct. my nurse, my MA, my care coordinators. And they manage 98% of those things. I never Correct. hear about it. But- when when it's when the patient has it managed, they feel like I did it. Well, I'm doing a revision or I'm okay. in clinic while they're feeling connected to me, and it's an improved connection, even oh, though and, I'm not at the moment doing it. Oh, and it's it has saved a ton of work on, on the part of our staffs. For my staff, they're making fewer phone calls. They have more time to do other work, right? And yet the patients are being uh, cared for in a more attentive manner. Yeah. Remember, remember the days, Trevor, when you had to apologize in clinic. Oh, I'm really sorry your message got lost. Yes, I'm really sorry that we left you stranded. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. That doesn't no happen more. anymore. Haven't that had does it. Does not all. happen. Right, right. Yeah. So patient care is just you know it's 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 really primary. Way improved in the ASC and and having these tools to be able to help you with that is just it's fabulous to have those things before surgery and then of course after surgery, which we're going to talk about for in a few minutes. But let's move on to the interoperative solutions. Um, because we know now that our patients are ready. You've talked to them about surgery. They know what to expect. Um, they've got their My Mobility watch or their phone that's leading them each step of the way. Um, but now we come to the actual surgery date. And we know Simmer Biomed has, is the leader in, in the market share in the hospital settings for both knees and hips. But as we move into the ASC, how do those implants change for you or how do the efficiencies change for you from your hospital to the ASC setting? Well, the awesome thing is the implants don't change, right? I mean, I'm still using, I mean, I, I the world's greatest total knee system. I still get to use that, right? Persona's with me wherever I go. Um, but, you know, when you start talking about the intraoperative thing, I mean, it's another big block of information, right? Because you, know, you talk about, well, now you're in an ASC setting. So efficiency is gigantic. And driving efficiency is easy to say, yeah, I want to be efficient. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> Are you going to think about the work you have to do? So Accelero comes in and really helped us in the planning stages, in the logistics of the operating room. We we have the efficient care program where you can, if you really implement it, you can drive your number of trays per total knee from five down to two, um, which helps everybody no matter matter how big your SPD is. If you've got a huge one like I do, they still appreciate not cleaning five trays. Um, so for me, those are kind of the elements. What, what about you, Trevor? How did it work for you guys? Oh, tremendous. I mean, look, I'll be honest. I In the hospital setting, I didn't really know what the costs were. I, I really didn't. And every time it kind of came up, it was a source of tension with the hospital. Uh, then we get to the ASC setting, and uh, suddenly it becomes actually a very important thing that I wanted to know about. And things that I never thought about before, like, hey, if I could just reduce the redundant instruments that I have on the back table and take away a few trays, or if I can get more efficient with my templating and peel packs and cutting blocks instead of having a whole tray of them, you know, what would that do for us? And we found, of course, that it was tremendously more efficient. It saved, uh, it was a major cost saving per case that was very significant. Uh, it made the staff happier because we they weren't having to spend so much time cleaning and organizing trays. We found that we had uh, fewer instruments missing uh, by simply becoming more efficient in this manner. And let me tell you something, and Jim, I'd love to hear your take on this as well, but when you get to this, and it's not like I'm sitting there looking at these things, I, I mean, 
I was interested to see it and said, hey, look what we can do it, it very, very easily by simply all getting on the same page with what we're using in the OR and reducing redundancy. But when, you know, 750 bucks per case is not a joke. And when you're talking about a Medicare knee, uh, you need to be thinking about cost savings, okay? Because that's how you have sustainability and longevity of the model, okay? So what this does is it positions you for 10 years from now. And, you know, now that we have HIPS coming on board, Medicare HIPS coming on board shortly, this is more important than ever. So these are things that, that you need to start thinking about. They're not difficult. I found it kind of interesting and kind of liberating in a way that I could finally, you know, know something about it. Yeah. But it's funny because it wasn't interesting and it wasn't fun when it was at the hospital. That's right. <laughs> and if you left me to myself, okay, Jim, uh, go be cheaper, go be more efficient, go go cost less. I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, right. I, but with, with the system they set up, with the process, again, hitting back on the theme of ecosystem development, foundational setup, longevity, interest in sustainability. They set this up so I can I can come to a meeting and they go, okay, here you guys go. Dr. Ballard, you cost, your total needs cost is X. Dr. So-and-so, yours is X plus 10 or whatever. Right. And I can sit there and I can action on it. I can go, how, why is that blade 85 bucks? Right. Well, we could get you a blade for 45 bucks. Well, why don't we do that? Well, because you never asked. Well, now I can ask. Like, why is that draped so much? And that sounds silly, but it's not a joke. You put it it's very well. 750 bucks is not a joke. When right. you're trying to squeak in a Medicare need or reimbursement of what is it, 8,400 or something, yeah. 750 cost bucks savings, matters. Cost savings is paramount uh, for the survival of the surgery center. Not, not to mention, just go back to the very reason we're doing this. This is a macroeconomic issue. We need to do surgery for less money. Right. And it's insane. Well, it's not insane, but it's silly that we don't dial down on expense. That's correct. The only way to do stuff cheaper is to dial down on this. And you can't dial down on it unless somebody hands you digestible, understandable information. That's and right. And that's what this helped us do. Yep. So I have a question for you, gentlemen. Within this um, efficient care system that Zimmer Biomont has, and you, you're having um, your, your trays that are things that you use all the time, and and your through your templating process, you're getting to know what what you need in the OR with you. But what happens when you get into surgery and um, there's something that that happens, and that you need something else that's not within your tray system? How how does that happen? How do you get what you need immediately? So you know, at our center, we have yeah we have things that we can kind of predict with that we might need that we just have peel packed and outside of the room. Uh, we also have a, a, a replacement tray, a full replacement tray of various things uh, right outside the room. And if we need it, we use it. We open it. We do what's right for that case, for that patient, no question. Uh, but it, it has not been an issue. It's not like they're running around uh, someplace down the road to get more instruments. Uh, you just have a backup tray. But you don't have to have 30 backup trays. So that's how we've solved that. Okay. You just have to think. You just have to think ahead of time. Total hips are a great example. Yeah. No. We when we started doing totals, I raised my hand. I'm like, "What cable system are we going to have?" <laughs> and they're like, "Cable system." I'm like, well, "I'm going to crack a femur at some point." Oh gosh! So we got a cable system. I said, "Well, we need two. Why do you need two? Well, what if one has a problem?" So you just have to plan ahead and just make sure you have it. You just don't open it like Trevor said. You just only open it when you need it. But it's just back in the in the central core. Right. All right. Well, let's move into um, some some different technologies and talk about some um, some robotics, if you don't mind. Um, we know those are things that are happening more in the hospital setting as well. But is that something that you can bring into your ASC? And, and if yes, um, how does that happen? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, when we built our current ASC, as I said, we built it with total joints in mind and we built it with a vision that we, we didn't want to be just people who could do total joints in the SC. We wanted it to be the place to go for your joint replacement, okay? We wanted to be able to offer technologies. We wanted to be able to offer concierge service. Uh, we wanted to be able to offer virtual attention to the patients. And, uh, and Jim and I have talked about this before. You know, I've used all, uh, really virtually every kind of navigation system there is because I'm interested in technology, but I'm very much a technology skeptic. 
And I ended up always going back to standard instrumentation until I hit Rosa and I stuck with it and really saw how different it was than other so-called robotic systems or other navigation systems, whereby this, this gives me the information I need in a way that I, I cannot get with other systems. Uh, it gives me soft tissue measurements that I can't get with other systems and it allows me to plant to make a surgical plan and see the end result before I make a single bone cut. All in a time that now is actually, it's, I mean, I've done a lot of them. So, you know, I've gotten over that 15 case, you know, learning curve, but, you know, I'm now uh, uh, faster than I am with standard instrumentation. Uh, so technology in the ASC setting, it, it's perfect. It's, per, it's very appropriate for the ASC setting. I, in fact, I think it's more appropriate there uh, because that's what we want to offer patients is this very personalized experience. And what's more personal than me using a robotic knee system that gives, that allows me to do a very specifically tailored surgery for each individual patient. Okay. So I think it's, it's a perfect setting. This is the kind of a, a data screen you see, and this is what makes me happy now. You know, the first few cases I was looking through this and figuring out now I glance at this and 30 seconds later I have my surgical plan. Uh, and this is making me think about knees in a different way. So as a surgeon, I'm very appreciative. I mean, you really have to know your knees and what you're doing uh, with your bone cuts and with your soft tissues uh, to utilize Rosa to its maximum benefit. I don't know, Jim, if that's been your experience or not. Yeah, I, I've been using Rosa for about a, a little over a month. I've done 12 cases. So I'm just at the crest of that learning curve you talked about. I mean, I I thought I did total knees really well when I started gap balancing with Fusion with Persona, yeah. and I think it, it was it's an outstanding tool. This is just another level of augmenting that and adding nuance uh, to the surgery. And I, I think when you talk about, you know, the ability to bring, to make the surgery center the place, mm -hmm. you know, for everything we're talking about, outcomes, lower complications, um, satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, bringing something like Rosa to the table allows you to offer, you know, the latest of, technological offerings, combining it with the persona knee system. Um, I mean, how could you not want to do that? And I'm, I'm a deep technology skeptic. And like you, Trevor, I've been around a long time, <laughs> which ages me, obviously. But I mean, I, I was around pre-CAS. Yeah. I've done CAS. I've done everything you can think of. And to this point, I mean, this, this system is just giving me, first of all, it's super fun. And I love the ability to fine tune and to know ahead of time, predictably what's going to come out. So uh, I, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And I'll tell you something, uh, you know, patients love it. Okay. And it's not like it's uh, promoted. I mean, patients hear about it for whatever reason, reason, patients like the idea of a robot assisting with their surgery. They get that the precision is important. Uh, and I can tell you that we are, as far as patient outcomes go, and we're collecting this data now, and Rose is a great data collection tool uh, and we can combine it with some other tools that we'll see here in a second but we are finding I can tell you anecdotally uh, and I think the data will bore the, will bear this out that those patients are moving better quicker they're back to work sooner their patient satisfaction scores are higher and they're using less pain medicine these are some endpoints some of the endpoints we're looking at so I think if, if you want to have do the best total joint replacement and you're doing the ASC setting this is a great kind of technology to have. Yeah. So it sounds like everything that you had in the hospital, um, you can still have in your ASC and actually be more efficient with it. Um, oh, 100%. And, tools and, that you you know, Rosa, Rosa can be used uh, along with other things we're talking about as an efficiency tool. You know, you can, you don't need uh, MRI or CT scan. Everything is plain x-ray based with Rosa. You don't even have to have an x-ray. You could, you could uh, get your points without an x-ray, but you know, you can utilize Rosa to template before surgery uh, and you could eliminate, you know, uh, uh, cutting blocks and trials and just peel pack them. That's a way to improve efficiency and cut your costs as well. Um, it's totally adaptable to each surgeon's workflow. So my workflow is a little different than Jim's. It doesn't dictate my workflow like other systems do. Uh, it's very compact. It doesn't take up space on the floor or in storage. It all folds up very neatly. It's easy to move. One person moves it from room to room. So if I have a day with all knees, I just bounce back and forth and just roll Rosa with me. 
So it's got it's improved on every single thing that was a problem with prior uh, robotic or navigation systems. Okay, great. Well, let's move on now that we've taken things, uh, taken care of things interoperatively, and let's talk about postoperatively. Again, those patients are leaving 23 hours or less. Um, how has that changed for you within the ASC setting, and how and how you have patient care? I mean, my everybody's life is better. I mean. <laughs> you know, my life is better. And I'm, and it's interesting because we keep at the beginning, and I think Trevor, you'll agree with this at the beginning, outpatient surgeons was, it was a little apologetic. Like, yeah, I know I'm not going to see them on day one and day two and day three in the hospital, but now it's like they, they, everybody is better off. The patients are better off at home. As I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, the complication profile is, is lower, et cetera, et cetera, on down the road. But managing the post-op environment is very important. Um, we, we don't use home health nurses. We don't use home PT. Uh, through my mobility, obviously, PT is available virtually, which has worked ridiculously well. And as far as virtual therapy goes, that's been studied even prior to my mobility and shown to work. But it's very important that that post-op episode be managed carefully with lots of touches. But as Trevor alluded to at the beginning, when you start doing 1500 a year or we're at about 850 a year then that's that's too much for people so the, the the ability to bring my mobility to the table with that and manage that post-op episode is absolutely irreplaceable yeah i agree you know there there is when you start out doing outpatient joints there is this kind of cultural moment you get early on where you you feel almost a little nervous sending them home that day because you're so used to having to trudge into the hospital the next day or two and see them in the morning and once i saw very quickly that these patients were happier at home because they're in the comfort of their home they've they've been they know what to expect they're getting the messaging and the touches they get home with everything they need and they're not awakened every two hours by a hospital staff okay these patients are just playing happier once uh, I got comfortable with that, now I tell you, like Jim said, it's tremendous not needing to go into the hospital the next day and do your five minute spiel with them, which was really important. But think about what that spiel was doing when you're rounding the next morning. It's everything that my mobility is doing a lot better. Okay. I don't have to shove three days worth of information into my morning five minute spiel and then sign the note. My mobility is doing it throughout the day, every day, and these patients are remembering it better. So I think that we have found a way to improve the episode of care and the outcomes precisely because we're doing it in the outpatient setting now rather than in the hospital. And, and I I'm not, Yeah, and I'm not getting nurses telling them different information about their pain medicine. Oh, my gosh. They're getting one message the whole time. So, so important. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that patients – that go through Trevor's outpatient program, feel more connected to his office. Totally. They are more connected to his office. They feel better cared for. They have better feelings about Trevor, better feelings about his office, seriously, than yeah. any inpatient case would ever have. Which, so you start talking about, you know, how, how do I market my practice? Well, a patient who goes through an outpatient program successfully. They will market it for you. This, are, are better than any billboard, any ad, any online thing. They're, they're your people that will go out and tell other people how great the experience is. And, and that's where that will build. Yeah, I agree. And, I, you know, just to pick up on that, you know, these patients feel more engaged. And I think one thing that, you know, using this kind of a virtual uh, episode of care with patients does is it, it makes them a part of the process, whereas before they were just passive participants. You have your surgery, you go home, you get up when therapy comes, you get up when you have to do therapy. Now they're much more engaged because this is giving them feedback about their process. They know that I'm seeing their steps, their range of motion, how, how, uh, how, how often they're up and going upstairs. Uh, they want to, they know that I'm looking at that and they want me to be pleased with that, okay? And it becomes a little bit of a competitive thing. So they know that when they come back to see me for their checkup, I have all that data and they want to look good, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And that is something I had not anticipated that has been pretty consistent with just about every patient, you know? And you'll see like the day before their appointment with me, they really push it. They do like, you know, 40 extra, you know, reps of something, you know? 
because they know I can look at that, but they are engaged way more. They're taking may, way more responsibility in their care. And I think that makes them much happier patients. Plus they know they have a direct communication with me via my staff who's checking all, who's checking their portal with messages. Oh, look, this is my incision. This is what it looks like. Looks good. Don't be concerned. Or, hey, that's something I need to see you about. Oh, and by the way, you do remember that swelling is normal and you can expect it for the next six months, just like we've been reviewing every single day. And guess what? Those patients are not calling about swelling. They're not calling about their pain medicine. They're not calling about, oh, I forgot, when am I supposed to take my blood, my aspirin, you know, postoperatively? Because they're getting it each and every day. It's cut down on phone calls and it's made the phone calls way more efficient. It's made the communication more efficient. You know, a phone call means leaving a message for me or my nurse, returning that call and getting a voicemail, getting a call back and playing phone tag, and then finally four days later getting hold of the patient. So now we have sit down. This goes directly to their phone. It's all done. And, you know, something to tag on to that, Trevor, is if you're, and I've been a patient. So if you're a patient and you're sitting there and something happens, ah, crap, what does this mean? Well, if you don't have the education that my mobility has given you and you don't have your binder because you lost it and you call the doctor, well, as soon as you call the doctor, you're Googling, okay, swelling. Oh my gosh, I've got a blood clot. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And right. then the doctor doesn't call you back because he's not available. That's and then right. his staff that calls you back either doesn't have any idea what to tell you or yeah. tells you the wrong thing, which yeah. happens all the time. Or they send you to the ER because they don't know. Yes. So then your anxiety is building. Yeah. And now the patient and the family are worried and they're nervous. And then you get back to them a day and a half later and you quell it all down. This happens and either they know it's normal, yeah. which is no patient anxiety, right? right. No family anxiety. Right. Or they text you, they don't call you, and they get a response. Like, if you adjudicate the problem like this, and there's no patient anxiety. You can't overstate how important it is to drop anxiety. And anxiety comes because people don't know what to think about yeah. stuff that's happening. And one thing Trevor mentioned that we use all the time is the photo. So I got a person who's two hours from me. They call, I think my wound's having a problem. Well, I might be with Trevor teaching a course in Dallas and my, they snap a picture wherever they are and the picture comes to me and I look at it and we can adjudicate it with nobody going anywhere. And right. I would say that 95% of wound problems like, yeah, don't worry about it. That's normal. Right. Exactly. Well, perfect. I'm sorry. We're having just a little bit of trouble with advancing the slides here um, at uh, in Dallas, but um I know that, uh, you know, all this information, you're getting this, so you're getting the information with my mobility pre-surgery, right? And you're getting patient or information post-surgery. You're also and getting that information with ROSA interoperatively, yeah. right? If you're using yeah. it at ROSA. That's right. So um, Zimmer Biomed also has a solution that's called Ortho Intel. And I know you, both of you gentlemen um, have looked at that and, and, and are gathering data that way. Can you speak just a little bit about how that's helping you uh, treat your patients? Yeah, I think for me, this is like the really important, really, really big picture thing here, okay? Because we are, you know, the whole episode of care is changing so that it's one continuous strand from first day they sign up to 90 days after surgery, okay? They're all on the same page. It's all going down. This is not a bunch of chunks, you know, a, a two-week chunk, a six-week chunk, a three-month chunk. Uh, it's very continuous as far as education, but it's also continuous with gathering data before, during, and after surgery. And so the question is, can we utilize that data and all these new technologies with artificial intelligence to create models, okay, predictive models that can tell me, for example, look, here's a patient I have preoperatively who really is, is gonna do great with doing their own therapy afterwards based on this data that we have. Or here's one where, who might have some difficulties. Here's one where I might wanna change my technique in surgery because I found that patients with this particular angular deformity do better with more gap balancing than with stripping away their MCL. So there's all kinds of data we can look at now and utilize it in a proactive way to benefit patients to improve outcomes before the surgery even occurs. And yeah, one thing I would add, and I, that's really well explained, the cool thing to me about Ortho Intel is that this, the offering um, 
is is future looking. So we're we're looking ahead. So Accelero is not a static thing. It's not a data dump on your center and they go away. It's we are the with Zimmer Biomet through Accelero. This is constantly evolving. We're looking now towards like Trevor said, analytics, artificial intelligence, pairing mm-hmm. intraoperative and post data with post-operative results and experiences and complications and successes and developing these predictive analytics. I'm not, I'm not utilizing ortho Intel as far as, because we haven't gotten that far with it yet, but that's what's coming. And it's just so cool that it, it is an evolving situation. Yeah. And, you know, Jim, just to add to that too, I think that there is going to be, there is currently a need uh, for data collection because as joints uh, uh, progress more and more to the outpatient setting, especially with Medicare on board, you know, Medicare would not be in this space if they did not want to stay in this space for a long time because the knees have been very successful and there's been a huge cost saving involved. It's going to be the same thing with the hips. And eventually, you know, these cases will need to be done in the outpatient setting. And there's going to be an episode of care. Uh, there's going to be an episode of care um, uh, re- restriction that we need to meet. We need to meet some sort of qualifications and present data in order to continue doing this. Yeah. And so this kind of data collection uh, is going to benefit the surgery centers. Even if we can't really see it now, we can see that it's, there's going to be a huge role for it, even within one to two years from now. And to have data collection be automated effectively, huge. like you told me earlier, where you're not, your staff is not calling going, hey, where's your, where's your Coos Jr. score? Where's your who right. score? Where's right. your... It, it, the the wad the, the the my mobility is going hey here's your score or right. you know and fill it out and That's then right. like, we just we just did a study on our Medicare knees and we harvested everything from the online engagement tool that that's mm-hmm. what we did and all the data came out there was no calling people because all the stuff had been done already that's right oh it's huge it's a big time saver let me just tell you you know practically speaking clinically. The patient sitting in the waiting room, filling out their three pages of data before they come back and see you for the checkup. Those days are done, and that's been a huge relief. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you know, it sounds like just all these technologies, all these things that um, uh, Zimmer Biomet Solutions has to offer really works together for the greatest patient care and for your efficiencies within your ASC. So we appreciate all the time that you've had today to walk us through those, but we've had some questions that have come in online. And so we'd like to uh, just take a few minutes to address those. And anyone in the room here that has a question, we have mics up front. If you'd like to to come forward um, and ask a question, we'll be happy to do that. So one of the questions, Dr. Ballard, this was pointed more toward that um, Accelero and um, how they came out and helped you. How long did that process take for you um, before you got up and running? So if someone was looking at building a new ASC, um, what time frame should they be in contact with uh, the group to be able to, uh, to have a certain go date for when they wanted to start doing surgery? So we contacted them relatively late. We, we were... We were building, uh, things were shelled out, and we were starting to hire people, and we that's when we stopped and, and hired them. So I would say from beginning to, to doing our first case was probably seven months or so. But what's funny is it's a little fuzzy in my memory because <laughs> there was so much that happened building up to this, but it was probably about the six to eight-month period. Okay. Lots, lots of meetings, which is okay. Right, right. Um, then the next question went to uh, my mobility. Again, that same kind of process. Was that something that you just decided to do and then and quickly um, just said, had a cutoff date and said, we're going to start doing it? Or was there um, a time frame of really having to have that set up? Dr. Pickering, I know that you, you had them come in and, and work very highly with you with that. Can you yeah, answer? my mobility, the my mobility people were great because, you know, this was new to us. We, we wanted to understand it. We liked how complete it was and we saw the potential of what it could achieve for us and for the patients post-operatively. Okay. So we spent a lot of time with them. It, the setup for my mobility is, is really nothing. You just sort of agree on your, your messaging, your templates, your algorithm for educating the patient uh, specific to your protocols and the my mobility people can set that up literally in a day or two. I mean, it was very, very quick. And we decided to start it. We are using it exclusively, at least in the beginning on uh, our outpatients, our outpatient mm-hmm. total joints. 
and I was the one who was starting it just so my you know skeptical partners could uh, see it and come on board and they did so immediately and then we had some hiccups you know we had a move you know shut it down and move to a new surgery center and get that started then we had COVID and that shut it down so we've had like three restarts to this but now it's a matter of uh, every patient that I sign up for surgery I tell them about it they get they get our uh, brochure and we are uh, checking to make sure that they are signing up because we believe that this is a vital part of their episode of care of their surgery it is mm -hmm. their educational module pre and post op so this is not something that we want the patients to have as an option okay this is part of the surgery and that's where we are now is making that clear to the patients yeah and i would i would tag on to that what trevor just said and I, I'm, this is not being blustery. I, I cannot imagine doing, having our program exist. It just wouldn't without something like my mobility. This online engagement is, is an integral part. It is not optional. Uh, when you come to our ASC, you, you get it. And that's just the way that it is. It's like, you're going to get an implant and you're going to get this. Yeah. But it is, it is to answer your question more completely. It is, is, it is easier for a patient to sign up. It's very easy. It is, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, it is easy on our end to capture that patient and get them on the portal. You know, everything is very intuitive. It has not increased any uh, time or work on staff. In fact, it has decreased time spent on phone calls once they are signed up. Uh, and uh, it's, and you know, there was a question I had in the beginning, well, you know, we joint, placement, joint replacement surgeons, we have a lot of elderly patients. How are they gonna handle this? Has not been an issue. Let me tell you, my elderly patients, <laughs> They have an iPhone, okay? And they're interested in the watch, but they have it, they can do it. They're more savvy than you think. They all have Facebook. I don't even have Facebook. I don't know what that mm -hmm. is, but you know, they all have it. So, you know, uh, don't be intimidated by that. They can do it. Yeah, yeah. We also had a question that came in, um, whether uh, do you have to have Apple Watch um, or an iPhone to use this? And the answer to that question is no, you don't have to. Um, we do have this available for Android use as well. Yeah. Um, so they're both systems. You're not limited to that. So we know that we know that half of the population uses Android. So um, we do have that as well. Um, so when you have the watch, is you said there's no cost to it, but how long do they have the watch for? So they have it through the uh, episode of care, which is uh, 90 days post-operative. Okay, okay. Uh, because that's my messaging through uh, my mobility continues to that period. Uh, through that period and then they have the option at the end of that of uh, sending the watch back and they've paid nothing for it or uh, apple has made a, a, an arrangement that uh, they can keep the watch and they pay some highly reduced price just to keep it as as an apple watch yeah uh so it, the patient has all the benefits in this you know we've tried to make this or my mobility has tried to make this an apple very easy on the patient in order to benefit their care and their experience yeah Okay, so another question that's coming in is about about Rosa, and they want to know. Um, there's a lot of different uh, robotic platforms out there. What makes uh, Rosa unique as far as patient care? So I think there's a lot. Okay, and I kind of touched on it a little bit before. The thing that really separates it out from other kind of haptic or quasi robotic uh, systems for me is that it uh, each individual surgeon can stick to their individual workflow seamlessly. Uh, it does not dictate the workflow for the surgeon. It is highly specific to each and every patient. It allows you to evaluate soft tissues when you're evaluating their deformity so that you really know what their gaps are prior to uh, your resections. I mean, this is a technical matter, but uh, you know, as somebody who was trained as a very strict you know, measured resection, mechanical access guy, to be able to now have the option of seeing what the end result would be if I allowed a little bit of constitutional varus to remain, that's huge to me, okay? That predictive modeling that the robot does is enormous, okay? So uh, I find that to be beneficial to my patients. My patients have done well. So to me, it's, it's uh, got more and better information. It's more patient friendly and easier to use. Uh, and it is way more efficient time-wise uh, than any other system I've util utilized. And one big thing that Trevor talked about earlier is the imaging difference. So other systems require, for example, a CT scan 
which insurance companies are not reimbursing. Right. So you're asking people with those systems to pay cash for a CT scan, which if you've, got, if you've taken care of Medicare patients, they don't want to pay $10, yeah. let alone $200. So with Rosa, you can do an in-office x-ray. Uh, it's not a super basic x-ray, but you can train your staff to do it. And, or you can do an imageless and the imageless system works very well also. So I, I've used it both ways. And to me, that pre-imaging uh, parameter is important. Okay, yeah. great. So another question that has come in is um, back to um, talking about just bringing patients to the ASC. Um, how do you know what patients to bring? Is there, do you have certain criteria for bringing them? Um, and, and how do you go about setting up those protocols? So I, I think that when you start, we all start a little narrow and focused, right? So you, you know, the, the term of cherry picking or whatever, you do, you do a couple of patients, but you're, you're going to realize really quickly, like Trevor and I have, that almost everybody goes to the ASC with, with limitations, right? So I think, you know, we, we agree on things like, you know, active heart disease, really bad kidneys, bad lungs, uh, those things. But we operate on people with controlled AFib. I operate on people that um, have, you know, early kidney problems. All this is not terrible. I operate on people with prior clots, well-controlled diabetics, those kind of things. I think it's interesting that we have actually come into more strict uh, criteria about smoking, for example, than I had at the hospital. Yeah. We all agreed that it was a no smoking policy, you know, for a time around surgery. We're very strict about sleep apnea, um, and in the end, we have excellent anesthesiologists that if I tend to be a little bit aggressive, I give a patient to them, they look at it, and I give them the ultimate the ultimate uh, final saying if we do the case or not. What do you guys do, Trev? Yeah, same thing. So uh, the default is outpatient, okay? Every patient is going to get outpatient joint replacement unless they have an uncontrolled medical issue like that Jim was talking about uh, or if, you know, up until uh, – Coming up in a few weeks, you know, their their insurance didn't allow it, like it was a Medicare hip or something, and we had to do it in the inpatient setting. But uh, and occasionally you get a patient who doesn't have who doesn't have anybody at home who can be there after surgery, which is one of our requirements. But that's pretty rare. Uh, and you know, come January uh, when Medicare hips come on board, uh, there'll be you know few and far between that need to be done in the inpatient setting. There always will be a need. For for that setting, I think uh, for people with certain conditions, but for us, just like Jim was saying, it's uh, once you once you get comfortable with it and it takes a little while, uh, you realize that controlled medical issues are nothing. These patients do just as well as everybody else and should not be excluded from the outpatient setting. And that's possible just to bring this full circle because of the depth of preparation, Trevor, you guys went through, yeah. that we went through, we took the time. Accelero made everything we just capped off is possible because of the accelero, my mobility, all of that yeah. comes together to allow Trevor to make that statement and to do it to yeah. be medically reasonable. Yep. Standardization of protocols includes evaluation of patients before surgery. And so that's exactly right. This has to be a complete picture and a sustainable picture, and that will equal safe and happy patients. Yeah, great. All right. Well, we're running out of time here, so I, I just want to thank everyone online for the questions, for everyone in here in the room. Um, and if we didn't get to your questions, please know somebody from our ASC team will be reaching out to you very shortly to, um, to answer those. So, Dr. Ballard, Dr. Pickering, um, if I could just ask you to do some closing comments for us to uh, the folks that are here, what, uh, what would you suggest for them to begin their ASC journey if they so haven't already? I would, I would tell you that this is going to happen regardless. So this is the one time in my career that we have been empowered to do something proactive that helps the entire healthcare system. And it helps you, helps the payers, helps the patients, helps surgeon independence. It makes the product better. It makes it cheaper. And as Trevor has alluded to, it's going to be demanded. It's being demanded right now, but it's going to become the norm rather than the exception. So do it. Now, it is intimidating to think about. And again, I don't care how smart you are. It's intimidating. It's a lot of work. It can be anxiety provoking to think about the details, but you bring Accelero on board and they will break this down into digestible pieces and get you guys through it. Um, and, you know, it, the, as far as cost goes, we can, they can work that out with you. You can, And it's worth it, obviously. Um, 
take the time, do it, and uh, you'll you'll never be happier. I think Trevor would agree. This is the best thing that I've done in my entire practice since I started. Yeah, I agree. And I will say, just to echo what Jim said, you know, this is not a gimmick, outpatient total joints. Uh, this is not just something to do because to prove we can do it. This is the norm, and everybody will recognize it as a norm in about one year because it's going to be demanded that the majority of total joints be done in an ASC setting because of the cost savings to the healthcare system and because it's a better experience for the patients. It's a better experience for the surgeons. And uh, it's a huge cost saver for American healthcare economics. Okay, so this is the norm. It's not going away. And it's, there's never been a better time to be getting on board and starting your ASC for outpatient total joints. Unlike when we started, it was a blank canvas and we were kind of winging it. And then we finally found some help. This is probably the best time to be starting an ASC because you have Accelero. You have places like Jim's place in Portland and our place in Jackson, Mississippi that are doing it. And there are models available. There are templates out there. There are pathways. So there's no reason not to do this and it will make for better, happier patients and happier surgeons. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ballard and Dr. Pickering for your time today. We sure appreciate it. Thank you everyone who's online and everyone here in the room in Dallas. We, we appreciate your attendance as well. If after today you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to um, Zimmer Biomed, anyone on our ASC team. Uh, we, can, we can help you walk through these things and get someone um, out to help you very quickly. ASC Solutions at ZimmerBiomed.com is our uh, email address. And and uh, we'll be, like I said, we'll be happy to get back with you very quickly. So thanks so much. Um, I hope you all have a great meeting and, and a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks. thanks.